we present the news quiz with your host, Miles Jupp. Hello, and welcome to the news quiz. We start with a cutting from the North Wales Daily Post, read by Cathy Clugston. A 72-year-old pensioner who was accused of flashing has claimed that any exposure was unintentional, as he was merely crouching down to collect nuts off the pavement. <laughs> Our uh, thanks to everyone who decided to share that filth with us. Uh, now let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first on my right, Francis Ween and Zoe Lyons. <laughs> and opposite them on my left, stand-up comedian Nish Kumar and Susan Kalman. So, Francis, uh, whose reshuffle caused a kerfuffle? Reshuffle, kerfuffle. I'd better watch what I say here, because um, Dame Edna Everidge gave an interview to Radio Times this week saying there's a new BBC edict banning jokes about Jeremy Corbyn. So that's oh, the end of the news quiz, really, isn't it? Um, <laughs> party leaders traditionally are our meat and drink. Well, our low-fat snacks, anyway. And um, when I first did the news quiz, it was Mr Gladstone and Mr Disraeli. And it was... <laughs> Years of fun we had with the Irish Home Rule Bill and things like that. And, <laughs> and then more recently we had Blair and Brown and Cameron. And, and then suddenly we get Corbyn and you're not allowed to um, make jokes about him because he's not a politician. He's not as other politicians. He is the Messiah or something. <laughs> and um, there are some of his followers, not all by any means, but some of his followers who um, uh, don't appreciate um, even the slightest little bit of... Irony. I mean, you think he would appreciate the, the ironies of um, history that uh, suddenly he finds himself leader of the Labour Party and after all these years of being a serial rebel, he's having to call for loyalty and all these... I mean, every day there's another of these things, but, um, no, best left alone, I think, because uh, it will get us into terrible trouble. And so I think we'll just say um, there's been a reshuffle and it's all gone awfully well. I mean, it's... Um, <laughs> uh, there were some complaints that he was taking five days to get rid of two shadow junior ministers... But, you know, I like a man who takes his time. He doesn't want to rush into these things. <laughs> so he had all these big names uh, that none of us had ever heard of. <laughs> who, so who, who did he sack? Michael Duger and Pat McFadden uh, both got sacked for disloyalty and incompetence, I think, as well. But then three other people reshuffled themselves by resigning. Actually, <laughs> more people did their own reshuffling than uh, he was able to reshuffle. Self-shuffling. So what exactly was McFadden sacked for? For saying something about the Paris attacks, saying that um, the terrorists should be held solely responsible for the attacks in Paris in November. That's and true. this was interpreted as a coded attack on the leader, which it may have been. Um, <laughs> Terribly he, well encrypted, though, it was wasn't encrypted. it? <laughs> But it was not, not so heavily coded that Corbyn couldn't read through the lines, and um, so he's been sacked for that. It was, it, it's led to a fair amount of awkwardness, I think it's fair to say. If you were watching PMQs uh, this week, the Labour front bench looked as happy as a bunch of vegans in an outing to an abattoir. They <laughs> looked particularly pleased to be there, and it's just a little bit shambolic, it seems. But fundamentally, one of the issues at the heart of it is Trident. So Emily Thornberry, who's now the new Shadow Defence Secretary, very much agrees with Jeremy Corbyn's stance on Trident, and they're going to try and change the policy on Trident at some point in the future. So he's kind of corralling the troops in order to get that. And it's about this loyalty aspect. And, and again, I'm not an expert uh, in defence matters, but uh, <laughs> although I have watched an awful lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger films, <laughs> the Defence Secretary, in my mind, should be somebody who has some experience as opposed to just being loyal. Loyalty is great. Uh, my cats are tremendously loyal animals, uh, but I wouldn't want to appoint Pickle Defence Secretary <laughs> because she comes running when I shake a, a box of dreamies. Surely being the Shadow Defence Secretary under Colburn, though, is an ideal job if you're just a little bit lazy, because there's not an awful lot to do, is there? <laughs> if you like that trident, <laughs> guns, no, we don't like them. OK, I'll just count these tables again, <laughs> shall I? <laughs> They were calling this a revenge shuffle, weren't they, from Corbyn? And I thought, gosh, that, that conjured up an image of me, somebody moving his corduroys and his wardrobe to a place he couldn't find them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you think if you were going to do a, a revenge reshuffle, like, if you were going to do... It, like, it's called a revenge reshuffle. 
you know, it'd be Jeremy Corbyn in a vest, looking at himself in the mirror, shouting, are you talking to me? <laughs> but it lasted three days and just a couple of things happened. Revenge to me is something passionate and, and explosive and... So yeah, I right. would... <laughs> That really was one of the most the chilling longest... looks I've ever been on the receiving end. <laughs> <laughs> have you been uh, gripped by it? Yeah, I, but I was interested because Duggar, uh, the Dugmeister General, seemed to have a very interesting theory. <laughs> he had quite a specific theory as to why he'd been sacked, because he went on Twitter <laughs> after it happened and said, just been sacked by Jeremy Corbyn, I wished him a happy new year, which I think is possibly the most passive-aggressive thing I've ever seen. <laughs> And he then changed his Twitter bio. I don't know how, not particularly I favourite social media, everyone has a little biography of themselves on Twitter that they write, and he changed his bio to sacked by Jeremy Corbyn for too much straight talking, which is too close to David Brent for comfort. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like he's about to say sacked for being a chilled-out entertainer. Yeah. <laughs> Can anyone uh, remember the names of uh, the people that resigned in protest, or even their jobs? Oh, Steve points? Doughty, I think, was one yeah. of them called. That's right. Uh, do you know what his job was? Steady on. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this has had the desired effect they were hoping for. We're like, mm, no. this, was one, this was one of the tragedies of the whole dramatic aspect, because someone resigned uh, live on television on the Daily Politics. He just went, no, I'm resigning, and everyone went, so, next on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was, uh, yeah, Stephen Doughty, Shadow Foreign Office, uh, Jonathan Reynolds, Shadow Minister for Transport, uh, Kevin Jones, Shadow Defence Minister. So, you heard their names here first, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, yes, excruciatingly, this was Jeremy Corbyn's Shadow Cabinet reshuffle, a joyously slow display of ruthlessness which, for exhilarating pace and non-stop action, compared very favourably to a game of lawn bowls played by people without arms. <laughs> It really was a thrilling couple of days as a large number of people understudying jobs they're never going to actually do waited anxiously to find out if they were going to be asked to understudy different jobs that they're never going to actually do. <laughs> In the course of breakneck, white-knuckle, 38-hour thrill ride, Corbyn managed to change the jobs of a whole two Shadow Cabinet members. <laughs> The reshuffle is said to be a test of Corbyn's leadership, in much the same way that one tests the strength of cling film by stabbing it repeatedly with a biro. <laughs> Corbyn promised a politics that would be more familiar to the lives of everyday working people, and he has delivered. The Shadow Cabinet now reflects the lives of everyday Britons incredibly closely, forcing them to work in jobs they never wanted for a boss they openly hate. <laughs> <laughs> Labour sources have been keen to stress that former Shadow Culture Secretary Michael Duggar was not sacked simply for disloyalty. According to The Guardian, incompetence was also a factor, so <laughs> that's something nice he can take home with him. <laughs> On the morning following the reshuffle, Jonathan Reynolds, Kevin Jones and Stephen Doughty resigned from the front bench, and I'm sure you'll all join me in mourning the loss of frontline politics of these three men I've never heard of before and cannot imagine will ever be required to mention again. <laughs> <laughs> Two points to Francis. Zoe, who's been given leave to campaign to leave? Um, this is surely the sexiest of all political topics. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the European referendum, and um, David Cameron has allowed ministers a free vote to campaign on either side of the referendum when we eventually get a referendum. Uh, but the, this has been seen as a, a U-turn by the Prime Minister because only last year he said there would not be a free vote. Uh, and people are quite surprised that a politician has made a U-turn. You think, really? I'm just surprised that politicians aren't fitted with those machines that go on the back of the trucks that go... <laughs> de, 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 de. This politician is reversing. De, de. He's changed his mind, you know. Every time I see uh, David Cameron sort of flouncing around Europe, talking away to Merkel about ne negotiating our, our conditions within the European Union, all I can think is when I look at them, when I look at Merkel, I go, God, she's got a lot of wear out of that green jacket, hasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, in a nutshell, right, this year we might get a referendum, but we're not clear whether it'll be this year or next year. It could be the end of this year, it could be the beginning of next year. The PM has said that it was very clear that he wanted people to vote with him, and now he's saying he's very clear that he wants people to do whatever they want to do. It's not clear who's going to vote for or against Europe. It's not clear where the polls are going to go. It's not clear whether it's a pro or a con to stay in or out. So just to be clear, we're really clear on this situation. <laughs> uh, so it was Ma, yeah, Ma, he told last... Andrew Ma, he told last January that they, they would not be given a free vote. Yep. Uh, now then... But then he, he saw how Corbyn's free vote worked yeah. so yeah. well in the Syrian debate <laughs> and thought, I could do that. I, I, for one, would like to extend 
My thanks to David Cameron for making that announcement, and I think I, I speak on behalf of, of everyone. Um, I mean, it's the topic that is... I mean, it's on everyone's lips. We're all talking about it, aren't we? We're mm. all talking about uh, the European referendum. And I think <laughs> the people, the people in, in England and Scotland who are currently mopping out sewage, raw sewage, and uh, rubble from their houses in the flood-hit areas will be saying, thank God... He has suspended collective responsibility. <laughs> Finally, I can hear what Chris Grayling thinks about <laughs> Europe. And I say good on you, David, because we, the country, have been waiting for this announcement <laughs> uh, for as long as I can remember. And I mean, the, the sense of relief in this room is palpable. <laughs> Of people who have voluntarily come to watch a topical comedy show, and the mention of Europe has knocked several people visibly nauseous. <laughs> like, it's absolutely incredible how little people seem to be. And it is, it's, it's either a very boring or a very divisive issue, depending on your level of interest. Like, The Telegraph did a poll this week about how all of the different supporters of the different political parties are going, and it's kind of 50 50 with most of the parties. And the most surprising division is that they polled UKIP voters, <laughs> and 72% think that we should leave the EU. Now, <laughs> my question there is, what's going on with that other 28%? <laughs> what on earth could they possibly be voting UKIP? Are they just fans of purple? <laughs> it's a group of secret Prince fans that have just seen the colour and thought, well, we'll vote for UKIP. I mean, I'm assuming there's not swathes of the Green Party that are for bulldozing the Amazon. Like, <laughs> Absolutely baffling. <laughs> I think that's what this needs. I think it needs to be sexed up a little bit like the, the weapons of mass destruction documents dossiers all those years ago. You know, they were claimed to have been sexed up. But I think we need to sex up the EU referendum. Every time it comes on the telly and they're there, it needs some sort of, I don't know, just sort of mild porn music in the background. <laughs> <laughs> it's the European Union. <laughs> are you in or are you out? <laughs> Gosh, I've never seen any mild no. porn. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if we're sort of drifting off topic. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> does, any, does anyone think this is a start of a race to succeed, Cameron? Well, it could be seen as that now, couldn't it? Because if, if they're allowed a free vote now and say Boris Johnson backs a very successful Leave campaign, then that might strengthen his uh, appeal um, to the nation. And then we could possibly have a Trump Johnson. Can you imagine that? Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, two leaders of the world. We'd run out of hairspray in about 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Does anyone know who uh, is going which way, Conservatives-wise? Who's, who's in favour of leaving? Who's in favour of staying? Boris has basically said, let me know the result, and afterwards I'll tell you which side I'm on. <laughs> like, I want to see if the country knows what side it's on, and then I'll just agree with whoever said yes. Mm -hmm. We've got Duncan Smith. Anyone know which way he's going? He's definitely he's, out. He's, he's out. He's, yeah. I didn't know the news quiz was actually going to turn into a bloody quiz by <laughs> <honesty>. <laughs> My first time in 20 years of having asked questions about the news. I didn't realise it was that. Well, I'm just mixing it up a bit. I mean, just, you know, we've got to do some stuff that can go out. <laughs> He's very anti. <laughs> Ian Duncan Smith's attitude to Europe is basically the opening credits of Dad's Army. Right? <laughs> Sensuously, this is Prime Minister and disingenuous welly wearer David Cameron and his decision to allow Cabinet Ministers the freedom to campaign against the government in the EU referendum, which is expected to take place at some point this year and is eagerly awaited by sadists and those with an unbelievably high boredom threshold. <laughs> A number of cabinet ministers have yet to state their position on the EU referendum. Michael Gove is said to be undecided, which is odd, considering everyone else in the country has so emphatically made their mind up about him. <laughs> Ian Duncan Smith is expected to lend his support to the Leave campaign, who one can only imagine are overjoyed. What, what an asset that man is. I, I don't know what he's selling, but whatever it is, I am buying. God. <laughs> Cameron isn't yet able to confirm details of the EU referendum, but has said this week that the campaign should last at least three months. And you can only imagine how giddy I am at the prospect of talking about Britain's membership of the European Union every week during that period. Let's hope the Now show will be on for the bulk of the time. <laughs> Two points to Zoe. Uh, Nish, have a listen to this. Uh, Nish, who's started the new year with a bang? Uh, well, I believe this is a reference to uh, all of our friends, uh, North Korea. Um, if you, like me, only get your news from North Korean state television, you will know... <laughs> 
they're the only ones I trust, Miles. <laughs> yeah. And their equivalent to the news quiz is somewhat dry. But <laughs> they, uh, North Korea may have detonated a hydrogen bomb. They say they've detonated a hydrogen bomb, but everyone else says, nah, mate, it wasn't a hydrogen bomb. Or if it was a hydrogen bomb, it's the sort of hydrogen bomb you could get at Lidl. But, it's sort of... <laughs> um, but they're saying that they've tested it. Definitely everybody felt a bang, but people aren't sure what sort of bang it is. There's a lot of experts saying, well, it was a big bang, but it wasn't a big enough bang to be a hydrogen bomb. And everyone else is sitting there thinking, are you really an expert? Because I don't know many experts that use the word bang so much in a sentence. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so basically, Kim Jong-un may have tested a hydrogen bomb. He certainly tested a bomb, but we're still waiting to find out whether it was a hydrogen bomb or not. Or a mere atomic bomb, which mm. would be yeah. all right. It, it might just be an atomic bomb, That's which is absolutely fine. Or the Harmless called... fun. Absolute horseplay. there's something horse between called an enhanced fission, apparently, which is sort of like an atomic bomb, but you add a tiny bit of tritium in the middle... And that really gets it going. Um, mm. and, uh, I think Nigella did that it's at Christmas. Then, it's very much <laughs> so it, it erupts and explodes, and it's, it's better than a normal conventional nuclear weapon. It's um, a Because a hydrogen bomb is, is much bigger than an atom bomb, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah, much, much better. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> Because when I heard somebody dropped an H-bomb in North Korea, I presumed it was a bit like over here in conversation if you dropped an F-bomb where it was inappropriate and somebody just mentioned his hair in conversation. <laughs> I've been to North Korea. Have you? Yeah. What, did you been invited there? No, no, I just barged in. <laughs> <laughs> Spent a happy week in Pyongyang once and travelling around the country. That was in the days of his dad, Kim Jong-il. And uh, it was a bit odd, to say the least. Because there were <laughs> massive statues to his father and himself. And then the, the Museum of Gifts. I mean, all, all rulers and world leaders give each other gifts, and they're usually fairly petty. But these are all in a museum, and the populace goes past them and bows and scrapes. Uh, and the things like, you know, a pen and pencil set that he was given by Fidel Castro and a sort of full-scale Rolls-Royce given by Stalin and a train given by Chairman Mao and then uh, a little stuffed alligator holding a, a tray of cocktails, a novelty cocktail thing, uh, a present from the Sandinistas, hilariously. <laughs> and then a little pair of castanets uh, from uh, Venezuela, I think, from Hugo Chavez or someone. It was, uh, Andy Kershaw, who I went with, uh, said, Oh, Maracas from Caracas. <laughs> Does anyone know what Kim Jong-un calls this, this bomb? <laughs> he calls it the H-bomb of justice. Ooh. It's part of a set, <laughs> including his sidewinder missile of truth, his uh, exoset of ennui. Uh, he's got a landmine of erotic regret. <laughs> <laughs> that was your wrestling name, wasn't it, Miles? <laughs> I was actually a bit more of a cage fighter, but yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we share bills. Um, <laughs> chillingly, this is the news that everyone's favourite apocalypse merchants, North Korea, say they have successfully carried out the test of a hydrogen bomb. The tests were carried out ahead of Kim Jong-un's birthday. This is the problem with having a birthday so soon after Christmas. <laughs> People don't know what to get you as a present, so they panic and splash out on something ridiculous. <laughs> His birthday is today, if you're listening, on Friday, and was Friday, if you're listening to the repeat on Saturday, having found the only working radio in a charred post-apocalyptic <laughs> wasteland. <laughs> Evidence for a potential detonation comes from seismic activity detected in North Korea, measuring 5.1 on the Richter scale, although this may just be the aftershocks from the earthquake caused worldwide by the news that Jonathan Reynolds, Kevin Jones and Stephen Doughty had resigned from the front bench of the Labour Party. <laughs> After the explosion, North Korean news stated, somewhat chillingly, the Republic's first hydrogen bomb test has been successfully performed at 10am on January the 6th, 2016, which one has to accept is very impressive. It's usually mid-February before I start getting the year right. Um, <laughs> they then continue with their schedule programme, Strictly Come Dancing or Face the Consequences. <laughs> Two points to Nish. Susan, who is crying out to trigger change? This is... Um... President uh, Obama, Big Baza Obama. So he made an announcement about the Second Amendment, essentially, which, if you don't know, is the constitutional right to bear arms, which is the right to have a gun, not to wear a pretty camisole top. <laughs> and... <laughs> it's a very controversial right uh, in America, and... Uh, President Obama essentially has made executive orders which don't really mean an awful lot because he can't actually get anything through Congress because it's Republican 
controlled, a bit more checks if you want to have a gun and sensible things one might think before you hand somebody a, a firearm. Now, the reason he can do it is because he's almost finished his presidency. So it's the end of his presidential term. Normally, you wouldn't get anyone in the White House making any announcements about guns because it's such a, a difficult issue and the pro-gun lobby is so huge over there. So he stood up, he announced these measures and he cried. What's fascinating after that is there are loads of conspiracy theories. The Republicans hate it. There's lots of stuff about how he didn't really cry when he was talking about gun control. What he did was, if you watch the video closely, right, he touched his face before he cried. Do you know what he did? He put onion on his face to make himself cry. Because <laughs> when he was talking about some of the gun massacres, he didn't really mean it. Because, of course, we're in the middle of a presidential election campaign just now. So the Republican candidates came out and said, we will overturn anything that he does. The Democrat candidates, specifically Hillary Clinton, kind of went, oh, well done, Barry, and then ran away because she's trying to get nomination. The Republicans got equally emotional, but in the, in the other complete opposite direction, though, didn't they, on the whole gun thing after this? The, the Ted Cruz came out and basically said, there's not enough guns. That's what he said. There's a lot of Republicans, who I truly believe, think that there won't ever be enough guns until at least... Everybody's got at least one gun. <laughs> <laughs> you keep reading things about because all of these Republican politicians are all they keep people keep talking about the power of the gun lobby and people keep expressing that as if it's a surprising thing. But of course the gun lobby is powerful. They have guns. <laughs> <laughs> like you're gonna be more scared of them than the fruit lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Is the NRA's response, I think. They think the only way to stop people crying is it's more guns. Yeah. <laughs> Anecdotal evidence suggests that a significant proportion of people stop crying after they've been shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> Francis, have you seen any world leaders in tears in your time? No, I don't think so. I... Have but you seen any? A, a footage of it. I've seen nothing. Thatcher crying. Oh, yes, Did she looked red eyed, yeah. yes. Osborne crying at her funeral. Uh, Pol Pot famously cried on Desert Island Discs. <laughs> <laughs> Piers Morgan's life story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got a gun. Yeah. <laughs> Out of context, that was one of the most threatening. Oh, right, no. <laughs> what, what kind of gun? Well, it's an air rifle. I've had it when I was about tw oh. 12. I say that, I don't know where it is because my parents have moved house recently. <laughs> have we got the gun still? Somewhere. It's in the box. There we are, you see. <laughs> Who's that? That's my gunkeeper. Who's <laughs> <laughs> my dad? Do you yeah. just bring your dad along to shows to verify stories that you tell? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a gun, have my dad? Yeah, yeah, I've got one. Yeah, yeah. He, just, he just backs me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it ha happens to be here today, and then I, there was something that came by. I realised I didn't know the answer to the question. He would be able to provide me with the answer, so I thought I'd sir, ask him. It just sir, seemed... are, have you been made to come along this evening? <laughs> It's the last place I want to be. <laughs> well, oh dear. well, at least my dad's storming it. <laughs> Kathy is awarding the bonus points tonight. <laughs> uh, Francis has got one for entertaining anecdote about North Korea, and uh, my father's now got one. <laughs> dissing me in public. <laughs> Incongruously, these were the tears shed by old Captain Drone Strike himself, President Barack Obama, <laughs> as he unveiled a new plan for gun control in the United States. People around the world were stunned by the footage, despite the fact that there is a long tradition of American presidents emitting bodily fluids at the most unexpected times. <laughs> Obama appears to have got the balance just right this time, and the sight of him shedding a tear has already become an iconic image. Previous attempts to usher through gun control legislation were thwarted when Obama chose to appear shirtless, cradling a small baby, <laughs> changed his Tinder profile to a picture of him hugging a tiger, and famously in tennis whites, walking away from the camera while scratching his ass. <laughs> Fox News commentators have suggested the tears were faked, and one said the podium should have been checked for raw onion. But I suppose it's easy to be skeptical about someone else's tears when there's not a single emotion running through your vacuous, poison-filled shell of a soul. <laughs> Two points to Susan, and at the end of round one, the scores are Francis and Zoe have five, and Nish and Susan have four. <laughs> we start round two with a correction from the Sunday Times. In the article Brotherhood of Hackers in last week's news review, we reported that Cal Leeming had an addiction to heroin. 
He has asked us to clarify that he, in fact, had an addiction to crack cocaine. <laughs> Thanks to Brian Sloan for clearing that up. Um, Francis, where are relations less than diplomatic? Oh, it's all kicking off in the Middle East, just for once. Um, <laughs> it's actually quite a scary week. It's some, um, you know, Kim Jong-un is kicking off in North Korea and the gun lobby in America is kicking off and Michael Duggar is kicking off. It's all, <laughs> all go. Um, but this is uh, Saudi Arabia. I think it's, the trouble is that for years and years, Saudi Arabia and Iran have been like sort of Manchester United and Chelsea. They've been competing with each other to see who can be the most brutal and um, who can execute the most dissenters and hang the most gay people from cranes and generally be utterly barbaric. And they had it to themselves. And then suddenly along comes Daesh, who are the sort of Leicester City of this analogy. <laughs> um, and uh, suddenly they're up there. And then they're, suddenly they're up there with the big boys and they're outdoing them in brutality and sort of barbarity. And so the Saudis decided... Because last year, Saudi Arabia executed, I think, 90 people. In the first week of this year, they executed 47, one week into January, including a, a Shia cleric. And that was what kicked it off because um, Iran was very angry about that, being a Shia state. So um, protesters torched the uh, Saudi embassy in Tehran, I think, and then... The Shias in Iraq started attacking the Sunnis and then some other Sunni states like Bahrain um, piled in on Saudi Arabia's side and it's all mayhem. And the latest thing is that uh, the Saudis are sending warplanes to just attack Iranian embassies anywhere, really. They're just in uh, Yemen, in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. They're just sending these planes around the world to get their own back on Iran. I mean, it's <laughs> such a complex situation. I struggle to get my head around it, I really do, and, I, you know, and the difference between Sunni and Shia and all, you know, the, the different branches of Islam. I've got a Geordie mate who's brilliant at Middle Eastern current affairs, and I asked him, and he said, the thing is, Zoe, Sunni um, was killed in a ski accident. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Shia... <laughs> went on to have quite a successful film career. So that... <laughs> but there have been protests all over the world, except from Britain, rather wonderfully. The Foreign Office, the best it can manage was to say that it viewed this with some disappointment. <laughs> it was just a bit disappointed to hear these 47 executions. Well, people have had a go at us for not intervening, but actually that is unfair, cos... I mean, we've armed both sides of this conflict. <laughs> <laughs> if that doesn't count as an intervention, I don't know. I mean, what do they want? Blood. Um... I've, I've got to take one slight issue with uh, Francis's football analogy, because surely, as Daesh are a group of expensively assembled mercenaries, they're <laughs> Manchester City rather than... <laughs> Anyone know who's doing well out of it all? Oh, yes, no, it's, it's good news at the petrol pumps for us. It's, I don't know what the effect on house prices will be, but the Daily Mail will be telling us shortly. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, but the Times had a story saying it's very good news for petrol prices because uh, the Saudis don't want Iran to make money out of their oil because Iran has been subject to sanctions for years and now at last it can sell its oil to America and Europe again. And so the Saudis are selling ultra-cheap oil just to stop Iran making any money at all. That's right. This uh, tragic foreign affairs story uh, is uh, accessible to Britain's sizable population of self-interested 4 by 4 driving bastards. <laughs> Glumly, this is the news that the execution of a Shia cleric has caused a new low in relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And call me a daft old Nostradamus, but to me, this is an early sign that 2016 is going to see a spot of bother or two in the Middle East. <laughs> Under David Cameron, we've sold Saudi Arabia £5.6 billion worth of arms, which is probably why we don't like to criticise their human rights record. Uh, nothing to do with corruption or our own awful moral bankruptcy. We just tend to believe that the customer is always right. <laughs> Foreign Office Minister Tobias Elwood expressed disappointment in reaction to the 47 executions carried out in Saudi Arabia at the end of last year, presumably because he went for 50 in the office sweepstakes. <laughs> uh, two points to Francis. Zoe, which table will have to pull up four more chairs? Ah, this is the uh, periodic table, which has just had its seventh row completed. It's taken a while, 
Uh, the periodic table first came out in about 1869, I believe. They've only just completed the seventh row. But to be fair, I've had an easy Sudoku in my back pocket for the last two and a half weeks that I've been struggling with, so it takes me a while to get my seventh row. Um, they've found four new elements to add to the periodic table, which is terribly exciting. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> These are synthetic elements. They are created by smashing nuclei into other things and bits fly off. And there is where my scientific knowledge <laughs> has ceilinged quite dramatically in front of a room full of people. Um, yes, they're synthetic and they only last for a, a microsecond of time. They're there and they're gone, very much like X Factor winners of late. Um, <laughs> they haven't named them yet. They are all super heavy elements. Uh, so it's numbers 113, 115, 117 and 118. Uh, but there is a lovely uh, petition from fans of the recently departed Lemmy from Motorhead who want to get one of the elements named after him, which I think is a fabulous idea. It really, apparently you can name an element after a place, a country, a scientist, a mythological concept, and I think Lemmy's antics were legendary, so I reckon that counts. So in a few months' time we could have... Lemonium, <laughs> which, which is pretty awesome. What number do you think he'd go for? I think 113 would definitely be there on the list, which is apparently the number of Jack Daniels he used to prefer of an evening. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly, this is the discovery of four new elements in the periodic table, as verified by the US-based International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, who it seems fortuitously not quite needless to point out are a great bunch of lads. <laughs> the four elements are added to all the elements that we already have, like uh, oxygen, hydrogen, uh, Wood and <laughs> and love. <laughs> the four new elements complete the seventh row of the periodic table, causing excitement in the scientific community and shouts of bingo from Professor Stephen Hawking. <laughs> uh, Jeremy Corbyn has already fired two of the elements, interpreting their <laughs> thousand... <laughs> interpreting their one thousandth of a second lifespan as a coded attack on his leadership. <laughs> two points to Zoe. Nish, who's driving a conspiracy theory? Oh, Nigel Farage has claimed he was the uh, victim of an assassination attempt. <laughs> they had sort of car malfunction in France, and uh, he said he took it into the mechanics, and there's a wheel problem. So there's apparently a series of screws that uh, should be screwed in. And he said that this meant that there was foul play with the car, and uh, it was probably because he was an enemy of the establishment and had dared to challenge mainstream views. He said that was what the French mechanics told him. Unfortunately... <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, a couple of journalists tracked down the French mechanics uh, who said, we do not speak English, <laughs> and we only communicated with Nigel Farage by sign language. Presumably what they were signing was, I mean, he comes over here and doesn't even bother learning the language. <laughs> and I think the biggest revelation here, Miles, is surely that Nigel Farage went on holiday to France. <laughs> this is a man of absolutely no conviction whatsoever. If he had even a shred of responsibility as the leader of the UK Independence Party, he would keep his holidays outside of Europe and exclusively vacation in Croydon. <laughs> if he even the merest shred of credibility, he would only be holidaying in Skeggy or Blackpool <laughs> or Scotland, one of the places of England. <laughs> But instead, he went to France and uh, he appears to have been uh, the victim of an assassination. Plot. And in his Swedish car as well. well yeah, it was his Swedish Volvo, car. It was a Volvo, yeah. I think his wheel came off. Mm. He'd had it repaired somewhere. They didn't put the nuts back on properly and it fell off and it was unfortunate it was on a French motorway. Maybe it was his Swedish car trying to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> it is surprising he's got a Swedish car. I wonder if he's got a mock Tudor body kit around it. <laughs> Make it look slightly more English. <laughs> He'll set up his own motor mechanics at operation. It'd be lovely. Somewhere like Skeg Ness, and they call it Farage's Garage. <laughs> <laughs> All night Farage. <laughs> Uh, staggeringly, this is the alleged assassination attempt made against kind-hearted purveyor of finely nuanced xenoscepticism, Nigel Farage. <laughs> Apparently, Nigel was driving down a French motorway on the left-hand side. Screw him. <laughs> when all four wheels detach from his car, leading to speculation that he may be the first party leader ever to find himself driving a metaphor. <laughs>
Judging from pictures printed in a Sunday newspaper, the car appears to have been a third-generation Volvo V70. Farage apparently insisted on a third-generation Volvo, as it would have had roots in this country and paid its own way. <laughs> Philippe Marquis, owner of the garage that fixed Mr Farage's Volvo, said that it wasn't until they reached the garage in Mark that they noticed his nuts were loose. <laughs> This is why the cough test should never have been dropped from the UKIP medical. <laughs> UKIP's only MP, Douglas Carswell, was forced to publicly deny that he had planned an assassination attempt. <laughs> I can't be the only one who thinks that when you're forced to deny assassinating your party leader, it puts the coded attacks of Pat McFadden... <laughs> Somewhat into perspective. Uh, two points to Nish. Um, Susan, have a listen to this. Susan, who's been a silly sausage? <laughs> this is the story of a Scottish gold miner, Michael McFeet. He was working in, in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, it was Hogmanay. Everyone was having uh, quite a laugh. And he posted a picture on Facebook of what they were having for dinner, which is a traditional Kyrgyzstan horse sausage called chuchuk. And Michael, as a joke, posted the picture on Facebook and said, we're all having a nice time having horse penis. <laughs> if I may counsel Radio 4 listeners, if you'd like to do further reading and research on the news quiz, not to Google horse penis in isolation. <laughs> I did so on the train coming down to London, and it led to an awkward conversation with the conductor asking me to leave the train at Carlisle. <laughs> funny. You put a picture of a, a horse sausage and say, look, it's horse penis. <laughs> However, he was arrested for racial hatred in Kyrgyzstan and faced five years in prison for insulting the national dish of Kyrgyzstan because he said it looked <laughs> like a horse penis. <laughs> It is to all of our discredit how funny we are finding this. <laughs> there is absolutely no suggestion that the sausage contained equine schlong. <laughs> he was arrested, though, if you look at the picture, the sausage does look like a, a ding-dong. <laughs> he faced five years in jail for this <laughs> insult to the people of Kyrgyzstan. He has been deported. He is not going to end up in prison. The end. Oh, nice and simple. Um, yeah. Uh, Bestially, this is the case of Michael McFeet, who has been deported from Kyrgyzstan after likening the country's national dish to a horse's genitalia. Mr McFeet took a photo of his colleagues enjoying their sausage and captioned it, the Kyrgyz people queuing out of the door for their special delicacy, the horse's penis, in what is believed to be a coded attack on Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> The incident has been officially declared the only interesting event ever to have resulted from someone putting a picture of food on social media. <laughs> it is not, however, a horse's penis, and should never be mistaken for one. Rather, it is a sausage made of lots of ground-up, reconstituted horse's penises. <laughs> tantalisingly presented in a penis-shaped skin. <laughs> Mr McFeet is apparently looking forward to getting back to the UK where there will be no more unfortunate misunderstandings, just simple home-cooked food like spotted dick and custard. <laughs> Please don't forget, recipes for everything we've discussed tonight are available to download. <laughs> Uh, before we reveal the final scores, has anybody got a cutting they'd like to share? Francis. This is from Andy Mabbott. It's something he spotted a listing in TV Times. Tonight, 8pm, The Nightmare of Bad Sleep, an investigation into the problem of sleeplessness in the UK. Fiona Fraser investigates why this is and finds out what can be done to help. The programme is repeated at 3am. <laughs> 
Uh, this in the Times after the, the warm weather that we've had over the Christmas period says, uh, the unseasonable warmth has been interrupting traditional Christmas activities such as ice skating. In Colchester, an outdoor ice rink had to close down after the company went into liquidation. <laughs> <laughs> Nish. Uh, this is a question and answer exchange spotted on Amazon by Zaid Bashir. Uh, the person asking the question has posted a photo, and the question is Can this machine be used to chop dates and nuts? I'm looking to make some raw energy bars. And the answer well, it's a kettle. <laughs> for boiling water. But if you could weld some sort of blade attachment to the base. <laughs> and steel yourself for vigorous manual pounding, I imagine your desired results could be achieved. I do think there are alternative devices on the market that could do the job more efficiently, however. <laughs> Susan. Uh, this was sent in by Ma Elietta Abdul from London, and it's a description of an app in the Windows App Store. App name, Learn Latin. App description, learning Latin has never been easier on your Windows phone. Whether you're studying the language in school, or planning a trip to Latin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now let us take a look at the final score. Francis and Zoe have nine, Nish and Susan have seven. <laughs> Before we leave you, here is an advert for thermal trousers sent in by Maurice Neville in Derby. Your legs will be lovely and warm while you tackle the cold outdoors in these men's thermal trousers. Multiple pockets are a handy feature to keep your essentials close to hand. <laughs> and with that, goodbye. Taking part in the news quiz were Francis Ween, Zoe Lyons, Nish Kumar and Susan Carman. In the chair was Miles Jupp, and the news was read by me, Cathy Cudston. The chair script was written by Gabby Hutchinson Crouch, James Kettle, and Tom Neenan, with additional material by Sarah Campbell and Mike Shepherd. The producer was Richard Morris, and it was a BBC Radio Comedy production.